All right, folks. That's enough fellowship. I'm just kidding. It's a delight to be together, isn't it? Um, I wring my hands a lot. It's just because I have arthritis, and it's not like I'm, hmm. It's just me, uh, if you notice that. All right. We're going to continue on with uh, Nebuchadnezzar today. Um, I should have just titled this, Nebuchadnezzar Gets His, but <laughs> that wouldn't be too nice. So <laughs> anyway, 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 um, let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to bless this time together. It's just such a joy to be with you this morning. Father, we thank you for the reality of who you are. The Lord Jesus, you define reality. You are life and light. And you uphold all things by the word of your power under the Father's authority. And we want to see you, Lord God, today. We want to behold your beauty. We want to understand in our hearts and minds more about you, but not just about you, to rest in you, to trust you, to fear you, to love you, to hope in you, and to obey you, our great and marvelous uh, living God. And so we pray that as we study today and as you, uh, we see how you humble the mightiest of men, that you would touch our hearts, because truly there's no room for pride in the Christian life at all. And uh, so we just give ourselves to you. Show us the truth this morning about your person. Uh, show us how a righteous man lives and responds to life and the trials of life. And, and show us a wicked man who can be changed by your grace and power alone. So, Lord, we look forward to what you have for us this morning. Uh, bless the time in the Word. Dear Spirit, take it and penetrate our hearts with truth. Uh, cause those in this room who love you to be more conformed into the image of your Son, dear Lord God, through the Word and the power of the Spirit. And for anyone who's walked in here, I pray that would, what, would, what happened to Nebuchadnezzar would happen to them, a heart change to behold your beauty. So thank you for this morning, for the beauty of it, the clear blue sky, and uh, it shines the light on who you are. In Jesus' name we praise you, Father. Amen. All right. <clears throat> We're in the middle of chapter 4. This is that great chapter on the humbling of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest king on the planet, ancient Near Eastern king at the time. And in the last half of this chapter then, we have Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Remember, he had the dream in, in the last uh, first part of the chapter, and in 4, 19 through 27, Daniel interprets it. Uh, following the interpretation by Nebuchadnezzar, we have his pride <laughs> and the fulfillment of the dream by God in verses 28 to 33. And with the end result, we'll see the amazing end result of God's gracious de direct dealing with this proud, arrogant king uh, and, and restoration of Nebuchadnezzar to his throne and his declaration of humble praise to God. This, this, these are supernatural things that only God can do. And so I pray we'll just delight in what happens. Uh, as we go through this. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar comes, two lessons we want to, you know, he's going to learn two lessons personally and acknowledge first that the Most High is the ruler over the realm of mankind and, and he bestows it on whomever he wishes. First lesson. Second lesson that he, the Most High, is able to humble those who walk in pride. He's able to humble them, and he humbles this man. Uh, indeed, uh, anyone who is a Christian has been humbled by him 
by definition, by definition as a Christian. So let's dive into it. This is interesting. Uh, Daniel's initial reaction of shock uh, to the dream that is shared. Then, you, then Daniel, whose name is Belshazzar, was appalled for a while at his thought, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king responded and said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. Belshazzar replied, Daniel replied, my lord, if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your adversaries. So here's the reaction to the dream. Remember who Nebuchadnezzar is now. Uh, the one who destroyed Jerusalem and the temple of his God and carried Judah off into exile. That's who we're talking about. Uh, has just related to him this dream. And, you know, <laughs> maybe you would think instead of, you know, maybe the reaction of an attitude of righteous satisfaction Yes, this wicked king is going to get what he deserves from God. You, you might think that would be the reaction, but instead, uh, what does Daniel say? He was appalled for a while at his, and his thoughts were alarming him, okay? The idea that Daniel was appalled means that he was frightened. He was afraid for the king. Uh, Daniel knew, I think, obviously, that God had appointed him and his three friends to be servants of and witnesses to the king about the true God of heaven. That, that's why they're there. He knows that's why they're there. And Daniel was genuinely concerned for this man. He had had uh, a master-servant relationship with for these many, many years, decades, decades. And no doubt in his position of authority, and we'll, we'll probably talk about this, see this, in the king's court, remember, he's the ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. So obviously he often had interactions with the king, right? He was in his presence, in his court constantly and witnessed to him concerning his God, the great God of heaven, Israel's God. I, I, I'm sure he did that with great discretion and discernment, but uh, and we're going to see he even confronts the king here. But the bottom line is there's this interaction that I think is important. That, and we can read kind of between the lines to see this witness to this king as he comes to conclusions about who God is. Uh, we'll see that. It genuinely alarmed him to think, of the discipline that God was going to bring upon his master, King Nebuchadnezzar. And you can see this in the, uh, this is a sincere, heartfelt remark. He's not schmoozing the king or trying to get in with the king. He says, my Lord, if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your adversaries. That's a genuine comment by Daniel, knowing what's coming. For the king. Okay. I think this is reflects Jesus' remarks. Matthew 5, right, a righteous man. Here's a righteous man. In the Sermon on the Mount. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter. For he causes his son to, to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And, and this is the attitude that Daniel is displaying. And, uh, you know, I, I, I confess, I, um, as I think of enemies, you know, uh, and maybe kid, young people in school, there, there are those who mock you or, you know, you see, they dislike you. Maybe at work you have bosses, a boss, who really dislikes your love for the Lord or something. Um, I've experienced that when I was flying. Uh, a crew that just made fun of me because I was a Christian and 
because they hated God. But, uh, or how about the government? Too many times when I see uh, an, uh, a, di- a, di- a headline about uh, one of the government officials doing what they're doing, uh, my first response is more of a righteous indignation or something instead of praying for that person for the grace of God to be poured out upon him. It doesn't matter, President Biden, any of the people we see. I, I, I don't respond. It's something critical instead of just praying for that person. I've been convicted by this to uh, do that quickly as those things come across my path. Um, but Daniel was that kind of man. He cared about this king. Cared about him. And he was concerned for him. So then we have the interpretation. Uh, part one, Nebuchadnezzar's prior blessedness in 4, 20 through 22. And so he recounts, you remember, let's just read it. The tree that you saw, which because this is describing the greatness and grandeur and majesty of his kingdom and ble- that God has set him over and blessed him in it, in a sense. Uh, the tree which you saw, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky and was visible to all the earth, and whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in which food, in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt. And remember this phrase, and in whose branches the birds of the sky lodged. It is you, O king. For you have become great and grown strong, and your majesty has become great and reached to the sky and your dominion to the end of the earth. And just a reminder, uh, Jesus brings this idea of the grandeur and majesty and glory of a, a kingdom on earth into the parables as he talks about the mustard seed. Kingdom of God, we don't have time to talk about it. Starts, it's, it's a mystery part of the kingdom plan of God that, that, that the kingdom, instead of coming full-blown, it, it starts like a mustard seed, but then it grows, and when this tree gets full-grown, it's like the glorious kingdoms of the past. That's his point. And, and in Daniel, we see that kingdom's going to fill the earth, crush all the other kingdoms, fill the earth to the glory of God. And so, that's the point with Jesus. And here's something else to note. Note the direct connection between the king and his kingdom. This kingdom's described, and he says, it's you, right? Uh, That's important with respect to majesty and greatness. Uh, A king and kingdom are associated. How much more with the Lord Jesus Christ? The greatness of his kingdom is directly related to who he is. And what's coming in terms of God's fulfillment of promise to set him on display. We can't imagine the beauty, glory, majesty of that kingdom that's coming that's going to fill the earth. That's where we're headed in history. We're going to talk more about that at the end. Tanner had some comments. He talks about it being the king. Um, Uh, halfway down, he says, at this particular time in history, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was the undisputed superpower of its day, stretching across all Mesopotamia, as far as the Mediterranean, and including even Egypt. It was God's sovereign permission that had allowed this kingdom to come about and for Nebuchadnezzar to be the man to rule over it all. Truly, it was a great kingdom to rule over. And Nebuchadnezzar was very blessed. God reminded him of this so that he would realize what was being taken away from him when that comes. And that the Lord was the one who controlled human kingdoms and those who ruled over them. Man, we're going to see that point made again and again in this text. We'll talk about it at the end, Lord willing. So, that's the greatness of his kingdom. Now, second part two interpretation, seven years of judgment. In that the king saw an angelic watcher, a holy one, descending from heaven and saying, 
chop down the tree and destroy it, yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field, and let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him share with the beasts of the field until seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king, that you be driven away from mankind, your dwelling place, be with the beasts of the field, and you be given grass to eat like cattle, and be drenched with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. That's, that's the second time in this chapter we have that idea. Daniel repeats the king's dream in verse 23 and then gives the interpretation in 24 and 25. Uh, Daniel's interpretation, this is important, makes it clear. Remember the angelic watcher that came down and kind of a council that was meeting and uh, makes it clear that the angel who came from this heavenly council is delivering the decree of the Most High. So um, what's going to happen to the king is decreed by God. The angels are involved, but it's God who is doing what God is going to do. That's important. And you know what? Throughout, <laughs> um, this sets the pride and will of the most powerful ancient Near Eastern king on earth against the will of the Most High. And people, there's no comparison. <laughs> you remember Psalm 2 and how God just laughs at men who attempt to resist him and throw off his rule, he's going to install his king on Zion, his holy mountain. So bow the knee to his king that's coming, that kingdom that's coming. Okay, it's just so silly to think that we can throw God off somehow. No comparison. And, and throughout Daniel, we have this conflict. We see the realm of humanity and the earthly kingdoms which men take pride in that come on the scene and run their course for a limited time. Set in contrast to the God of heaven who rules over all human kingdoms, but whose kingdom itself is an everlasting kingdom which cannot and will not be destroyed. Major contrast. All to exalt God's name. Remember, God has chosen to set himself on display in the midst of this kind of conflict. It's his plan, his purpose, to have this enemy that has to be dealt with and to have fallen human beings who resist him with, in their blindness, in their control by the enemy, to set his name on display. So the judgment especially is going to affect the king, but when, it, when the king is affected by a judgment, it affects the kingdom, right? Uh, for he was to be driven. He would behave like a wild animal being fed grass. The, the term can also mean perhaps herbage and vegetation. Damp with dew, that means he's sleeping out in the field, you know, and the dew, like it does on the grass, covers his body, you see, uh, spending his nights out there. How long is this going to be? The seven times, uh, theologians believe, of course, that's seven years. Can you imagine? Man, I can't imagine. His punishment would continue until he recognized that the Most High exercised his authority his authoritative rule over the realm of humankind and had the right to give it to whomever he wanted. It's, it, the, uh, Tanner says the punishment's appropriate for him. He lost control of his kingdom because he lost control of himself, and this acting like a beast, he was allowed to live with beasts. Um, Archer said the prolonged humiliation would teach him to respect God's sovereignty. But, you know, the, the learning the lesson only comes by the grace of God because people 
that God does these kinds of things with often do not learn the lesson, do they? They don't. So God's involved in this whole thing to learn this lesson, to realize who this God is and who he is in relationship to this God and the authority that God has. And, and, and he makes that last comment, uh, Archer says, God's sovereignty, learning it's over the affairs of men, and to realize that he, like all earthly rule, rulers, held authority, get this, only by permission from the Almighty in heaven above. Isn't that true? Do you remember when Jesus was before Pilate? What did he tell Pilate when Pilate says, I have authority to put you to death or let you go? You would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. And we read in Peter that because that's true, Jesus goes to the cross, despising the shame, entrusting himself to him who judges righteously, the one who is absolutely in control over all things, knowing it's not the world, it's not Pilate. It's not Nebuchadnezzar who's in control. Same thing for us. Mm-hmm. Yes. If he had the mind of a beast, how could he come to the realization that God was... Yeah, that's a good question. She said, if he had the mind of a beast, how could he come to a realization? I think at the appointed time, God starts to bring him out of it and teach him. Does that make sense? Because he, he would have stayed that way unless God had said that's... Enough. As, as I bring the truth to you now, you will understand. Does that make sense? He'd been humble. That's a good question. Okay. The interpretation part three, future grace. And in that it was commanded to leave the stump and the roots of the tree, your kingdom will be assured to you after, again, you recognize that it is heaven that rules. That's the third time in chapter 4 that idea is set forth for us. It's you know, after you learn what God has for you to learn, things will change. And like we said, God is, is working to change hearts, to bring men to learn lessons. Certainly in his children, under the influence of the Spirit, there's a learning that's going on as God teaches us lessons. He disciplines us. He loves us. He's always working. The Spirit is always influencing you as a Christian to bring about conformity to the image of Jesus Christ for the glory of God, so that one day he'll be the firstborn among many brethren. But we learn lessons, don't we? By the grace of God. Page four, Daniel tells the king that even when his judgment comes upon the king, which will incapacitate him from ruling for seven years. That the Most High, the Most High has commanded that his kingdom will not be taken away from him, but that your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is heaven who rules. Now, I want you to think about that because sometimes we just read over that. This command by God... (laughs) It's in itself preserving is, is an amazing demonstration to King Nebuchadnezzar that it is the Most High who rules over the realm of mankind and gives it to whomever he pleases, right? For such a powerful king to be unable to rule for seven years and still retain his throne after such an extended period of time People, wouldn't you agree, that, that's a supernatural testimony to the reality of God's presence and power doing what God said he's going to do. It, I think it rivals the deliverance of the Hebrew young men from the fiery furnace. It's that kind of power being exercised. Without God's supernatural preserving power of his kingdom, what do you think would happen? It's not hard to imagine. What happens when a king like this takes that kind of a dive? What what about all the guys under him? Ah, man, now's the time I'm going to grab the throne. 
relatives, advisors, who knows? Just read the history of kings and see how many are put away, put down, assassinated, so the next guy can come Roman, up to power. Roman emperors. Roman emperors. Yeah. 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 But this is seven years. Doesn't happen. What about the other kingdoms he's ruling over? As soon as word starts spreading that this is happening to Nebuchadnezzar, the first thing nations do when that happens is now's the time to throw off the yoke. They're in disarray. Now's the time. Maybe we can even throw, overthrow them. Do you see my point? The Most High has commanded that you're not going to lose the kingdom, even after seven years of extended incapacity to rule. That's amazing. That's, that's a miracle. And it, it shows that he's in control. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Yes. No, no. It's, it's, it's partly to show him who does rule over the realm of mankind. Because it's so obvious that he would lose the kingdom if it wasn't God keeping it for him. That's just wonderfully powerful. So, but and again, we see that the point of God's judgment on the king is to humble him. He, he must truly acknowledge and come to an understanding, not just in his head, that heaven rules before he is restored in his rule. Man, this is amazing. Amazing. You know, you would think all this is after about the lion's den and the fiery furnace. This is all, that was before. Fiery furnace was, a lion's den's coming under uh, King Darius, the Mede. Okay, well, even just the fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar must have had an enormous ego because he saw <laughs> that and went, whoa, you know. Yeah. But still, I'm yeah. the man. I'm the man. Because God can keep these people from burning, but I'm still the man. Yeah. It, it didn't, he didn't learn the lesson until it gets personal. <laughs> right? Exactly. Good, good we can about. hear things. We can see things. About, uh, we mentioned this last week. You can hear things, see things, watch God work in other people's lives, do miraculous things from people on the mission field, and you can appreciate it, but it doesn't impact you until God gets personal with you. When God comes and deals with you personally, that's when salvation takes place because you need a new heart, and only God can do that. Okay, Daniel's advice. Here we go. His wisest, greatest counselor. Now, this is amazing what he does. Listen, therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins. <laughs> Woo. Remember who he's talking to. I don't like your face today. Chop his head off. Yes, sir. Break now away from your sins by doing righteousness. He's telling the and king he's telling the king, he's, he say, my, may my advice be pleasing to you. And from your iniquities. And what's he want him to do? By showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. He cares about the king. So he tells him the truth. Is there a difference between sins and iniquities? Yeah. Same idea. Same idea, in a sense, parallel ideas. Daniel, in a very gracious and respectful manner, out of concern for the king's welfare, share. He's not being puffy or proud or trying to take authority to him. So he just cares about this man and the kingdom. He knows where God is taking things and how it's going to affect Israel. Shares his heart with him and essentially pleads with him to do what? Repent, king, repent. Repent. 
of the sinful way he was dealing with his people in the pursuit of promoting his own glory. And here's, here's the kind of the idea. He exhorts him to do righteousness by showing mercy to the poor or the same, or, or, or oppressed. Concerning the poor being oppressed, Tanner comments, Nebuchadnezzar in all his zeal to build massive cities, temples, and palaces had harshly oppressed many people, kind of like in Egypt with Israel, using them as cheap labor, paying only meager wages. They were oppressed and living in poverty. Well, well how's he living? Wow. Palace. Enjoying the luxuries of his palace. Daniel was keenly aware of these social injustices and beckoned the king to change, it, change all this by being merciful to his subjects. Be a righteous king. You see? What is the, just an aside, what is the best form of government on the planet? Is it a democracy like we have? Everybody goes, yeah, in the United States, democracy. We've got to make that ha happen in all the countries. No, the best form of government is a righteous king who can do what is right for his people because guess what form of government's coming that is the best form of government? Jesus Christ ruling this planet. It's not a democracy. But what a great government because of who he is. See, you've got a righteous king, you're blessed. So he's pleading with the king to be righteous. He exhorts him. Archer says, you know, this, this took a lot of courage. <laughs> Daniel needed real courage to inform his royal master that his rule was marred by sin, the sin of oppression and callousness toward the poor and disadvantage among his people. Daniel's candor might have cost him his high office or even his life. To do this, you've got to trust God. You've got to trust God to do this. Okay, and I just wrote a note. Implication, we, we can think through this, but if you truly care for someone, even an enemy, you need to tell them the truth for their good and God's glory. Did Jesus tell the Pharisees the truth? You better believe it. And it wasn't pretty, but he told them the truth. He just didn't let them press on in their ignorance, in their sin. He told them the truth. People, we need to tell people the truth. We'll talk some more about that, about what's coming and the need to get the word out. Um, in terms of the prolonging of his prosperity, Dr. Chisholm said, Daniel hoped, I think this is fair, that the punishment envisioned in the dream might be averted through his repentance, okay? He urged Nebuchadnezzar to repent of his sins and promote justice in his realm in hopes that the king's success might continue uninterrupted. And you know, God can make a decree of judgment but not carry it out. You remember Jonah and Nineveh? Yet 40 days and Nineveh is going to be destroyed, overthrown. What happens? Daniel, that's why he didn't want to make the proclamation, because God's a gracious God. What happened? They repented. Were they overthrown in 40 days? No. If the king had truly repented and changed his ways, probably the judgment would not have fallen. But does he repent? Nope. This is amazing to me, but it's typical. It's typical of people. Nebuchadnezzar is prideful boasting. Say Nebuchadnezzar five times. It's hard. All this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. The king's reflecting and says in his heart, my, is this not Babylon the great? Which I, get the, get, <laughs> which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty. What's going to happen now? I think it's worth noting that God just doesn't immediately bring judgment. He gives him some time, doesn't he? A year. He gives him a year to reflect on Daniel's advice to him and repent of his sins and iniquities. Man, 
in the oppression of his people and to do righteousness by showing mercy to the poor. Um, you know, God is patient and gracious, isn't he? He gives people time to repent. You can see that in Revelation with the sin in Thyatira um, where he gives them time to repent. Uh, in the church, there was bad teaching. And um, he, this is what it says in Revelation to the church of Thyatira uh, after uh, something good. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. And she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent. He just didn't send a lightning bolt and vaporize her. I gave her time to repent. And she does not want to repent of her immorality. That's the problem. Unless God is at work, all the time you have won't matter. Just like with Nebuchadnezzar. But he's still gracious to give, from the human perspective, time. You plead with people, repent, 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 trust in Christ because you're coming to the end of your life in the, in the, in the, in the hospital, deathbed. Please, please trust Christ. We never stop doing that. Perhaps God may grant repentance. So Nebuchadnezzar has some time. But here's what's going on, I think. This is just a thought. I, it seems that the time God gave him only allowed the dream and promised judgment to be forgotten. <laughs> as things continued on as usual in his kingdom, you know, month after month after month after month, he forgets, right? And then one day he's walking on the balcony. He doesn't remember and he says, and we, we, we know what he just said, it's all about me, my glory, my power, what I've done. And here's a cultural note. This, this city was amazing, guys. Um, Nebuchadnezzar referred to the city as the great Babylon, Miller says, and indeed it was great. Babylon was one of the preeminent cities of history, and during Nebuchadnezzar's reign, undoubtedly was the most magnificent and probably the largest city on earth. Babylon was, rec uh, was a rectangularly shaped city surrounded by a broad and deep water-filled moat and then by an intricate system of double walls. The first double wall system encompassed the main city. Its inner wall was 21 feet thick <laughs> and reinforced the defense towers at 60-foot intervals, while the outer wall was 11 feet in width and also had watchtowers. Later, Nebuchadnezzar added another defensive double wall system, an outer wall 25 feet thick and an inner wall 23 feet thick east of the Euphrates that ran an incredible distance of 17 miles and was wide enough at the top for chariots to pass. He's building Fortress Babylon. Nobody's going to touch me here. Oh, <laughs> sorry. The Most High will touch you there. Height of the walls is unknown, but the Ishtar Gate, maybe some of you have seen that. I'm sorry I don't have the high-tech stuff today. Beautiful gate, 45 feet high, or 40 feet high, and the walls would have been approximate to that size. Can you imagine trying to storm that city? <laughs> There's no way. But what happens, we see later in Daniel, they fall in a night. It's marvelous our God reigns. In the boasting, uh, Tanner points out three things. He claimed first to have built the city himself. It's his own personal royal residence. It's all about him. Second, he claimed to have built it by his own mighty strength, even though it was built on the sweat of thousands of subjects who were oppressed under him, slaves, foreign captives. Third, he saw the city's purpose as being what? For his glory, honor, and majesty. Big mistake. The lesson voiced by the angel then in his dream that the living may know that the Most High is the ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whom he wishes had been, I believe, completely forgotten. 
But he is about to experience the reality. Here's the reality. What God declares that's going to happen will happen. Here's an implication. You know, people, think, think of the country we live in, the world we live in. Think how people relate to things. Fallen mankind in the past today and today ignores the word of God concerning truths about eternal life and death and the judgment that is soon coming on this God-hating, God-ignoring, truth-suppressing world. Remember 2 Peter 3? Know this first of all, that in the last days, we're in the last days, way down the road, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust, that's the problem, and saying, because they want to pursue it, where's the promise of his coming, Peter? You preached right after he ascended, he's coming. What ha what's happened 30 years later? Hey, he's not coming. For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice what happened at the flood when God judged the whole earth with water. And Peter says, but by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for a fiery judgment. That's the day of the Lord that's coming, right? A day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. God gave Nebuchadnezzar a direct divine declaration of coming judgment if he did not deal with his proud, arrogant, self-centered perspective, and it made no difference to him. We have God's divine declaration that the day of the Lord's judgment and the glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, are coming soon, and the world laughs at these truths, doesn't it? <laughs> You're nuts. You're nuts. And you know what? And I felt this too. You, you know the movies, and, and you've got the guy, the decrepit old dude on the corner with the sign, the end is near. And everybody's just driving around. What an idiot over there. And that's it. That, it, it, it. Well, sometimes as Christians, well, all the time, we need to warn the lost, to flee from the wrath that is coming on this wicked world. Flee from the wrath to come. What are you talking about? Everything's, what are you, you're, you're crazy. To flee into the arms of the only one who can deliver them from the coming wrath, who is the, the one who's bringing the coming wrath is the one you need to flee to to escape it, the Lord Jesus. Run into his arms he's going to execute that judgment. He's coming with his angels in flaming fire to deal out retribution to all those who do not obey the gospel. So, sometimes we don't like to talk about that kind of judgment, do we? Because we don't, you know, we're, we're a little bit uh, shy about it because it's associated with that old guy on the corner who's mad. Speak up. Tell people, God has said it, it's going to happen, and it's going to happen soon. It's going to happen soon. So God judges Nebuchadnezzar. I love this. While the word was in the king's mouth, but, 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 bing. <laughs> while the word, you know, <laughs> buddy, I told you, I told you. Immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled, verse 33. He was driven away, and this happened to him. God's judgment is immediate, begins with a voice from heaven. It doesn't happen. He's told why he's being judged again. He's told by the angel, sovereignty has been removed from you. Who alone can do that? The one who rules over the realm of the mankind and gives the kingdom to whomever he pleases. He's going to take it away from you, Nebuchadnezzar. He's also going to give it back to you. He's in control. Until you recognize that he rules the realm of mankind. Fourth time that's mentioned. Verse 33 describes the literal, literal reality of the king's, king's physical condition. There's names for this. I, don't, I mean, you're basically out of your mind. And, but here's, here's a point. This description of his 
humiliation, wouldn't that have been an embarrassment to the greatest king on, on the earth? Yes, but he shares it with his people because he has really been humbled. He shares this with them. It would have been personally embarrassing for the king to share as part of his recorded public testimony what had happened to him. Hair like feathers of a bird and nails like bird's nails. And oh my gosh. But he truly responds with God's grace humbling him. Nebuchadnezzar's restoration and humble praise for God. I'm not going to read this. We're going to read it as we kind of go through the, the text, but it's magnificent. It's magnificent. In these verses, we see that God's direct personal humbling of King Nebuchadnezzar had its desired effect on his heart. The statements made by this changed pagan king of Babylon about the God of Israel are some of the most majestic and profound statements in the Old Testament about God. <laughs> he learned. <laughs> God directly dealt with him. He does not just thank him for preserving him, but the text states that he blessed the Most High and praised and honored, gave glory to him who lives forever. Guess what? Psalm 102. I say, oh, my God, do not take away, take me away in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all generations. The one who lives forever, of old you founded the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure, and all of them will wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them, and they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. Who's interacting with this king, remember? Daniel. Daniel has access to the scrolls. The king then declares the reason for his praise, for his dominion, we saw this before, is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. Psalm 145, 13, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. Daniel, sharing truth with the king. The king goes on to say in verse 35, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? Call him to account. Isaiah 40, 15 through 17, behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. And in Isaiah 40, 14, 27, for the Lord of hosts has planned, and who can frustrate it? Who can call him on the carpet? And as he, and, and as for his stretched out hand, who can turn it back? Does that sound, do these sound like the things Nebuchadnezzar was saying about God? Where do you think he got them from? Daniel, I think. And the text that he had with him, he's sharing with this man. In verse 36, he testifies that God not only preserved his rule, but gave it back to him. And then he adds, and surpassing greatness was added to me. Isn't that grace and mercy? God even made it better for him than what it was. And then finally, well, first, Nebuchadnezzar then was a living example. He's a living example that the Most High was the Lord of kings, and the ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. He's an example of that. He lived it. Then the great king concludes in verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven. He, remember, he raised his eyes to heaven. He's acknowledging this king, this God. For all his works are true. And his ways are just. The man just spent seven years eating grass like an ox, but that's just because it came from him. 
And he is, here it is, he's able to humble those who walk in pride. Okay, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about these two great lessons that Nebuchadnezzar learned for us. Just I've given you first, God is able to humble those who walk in pride. Or, we might say, that God and human pride cannot coexist. They are mutually exclusive. We have some texts. What's the opposite of pride? Humility. Humility. So let's read some of these and just see what pleases God and what doesn't. Proverbs 6, there are six things which the Lord hates. Guess what leads them? Seven which are an abomination. First thing, haughty eyes, proud eyes, arrogant eyes. And he goes on. Proverbs 11, 2, when pride comes, then comes dishonor. But with the humble is wisdom, humble. See, a, a, humility is associated with a righteous man. Pride is associated with the fool. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Proverbs 18, before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, but humility goes before honor. I love, th listen to Isaiah 66 too, people. It's talking to Israel, for my hand made all these things. I'm the great creator God. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look. See, he's a t he's <laughs> who does God look, to look at, pay attention to? His own, actually, this one I will look to. To him who is humble and contrite of spirit, and get this, who trembles at my word. People, do you tremble at the word of God? What's going on? God is love. Look at what's going on in the Bible, though. God is holy, righteous God who's moving all things to a glorious consummation, which includes eternal blessing and eternal judgment. I mean, the things God says about what's coming should cause us to tremble because it's a manifestation of what he's doing and why he's doing it to express who he is and exalt Christ. And not everybody's going to get good stuff when it's all said and done. There's a lake of fire, people, along with a new heavens and a new earth. We need to tremble at his word because of who he is. Page 10, last page. But isn't that fair? Trembling at the word. We don't think that way, do we? We tremble at the word because of whose word it is. And he is going to do what he says he's going to do. And he's not partial. Remember Romans? <coughs> he's not partial. You're not going to get in because you think you're a good guy or something. He's impartial. It's the one who lives by faith, who manifests the obedience of faith, who loves God, fears God, hopes in God, trusts in God, and obeys God, who is the overcomer, who God the Father says, I will be his father and he will be my son. That's who's going to get into blessing. Nobody else. Twice in the New Testament, it says God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. James and Peter. Matthew, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Beatitude, Matthew. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That's humble. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What proceeds out of the man defiles him, and notice at the end, pride and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. In the next two texts, Isaiah 2 and Isaiah 13, it talks about why the day of the Lord is going to come on this earth. And you know what's, what's highlighted in these texts of coming judgment? Man's pride. Man's pride. For the Lord of hosts, 2.12, will have a day of reckoning against everyone who is proud and lofty and against everyone who is lifted up that they may be abased. <laughs> Isaiah 13 
Verse 11, thus I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. Wow. What is it the Christian boasts in? Huh? Say again. I'm sorry. My, my, in the Lord. In the Lord. Uh, yes, thank you. My wife tells me I need hearing aids, but I resist. <laughs> Not me. That's boasting. It. Okay. <laughs> in the Lord. She said, in the Lord, right? In the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's the same. Listen to Jeremiah 29. Or 9, 23. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, let not a mighty man boast of his might, let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. What is eternal life in the New Testament? This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Same thing here. Boast in the fact that you know me because that's my grace that brings you into a relationship like that. That I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Old Testament, New Testament, Galatians 6, 14, but like you said. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You want to boast in something? You boast in Jesus Christ. Not yourself. You didn't save yourself. You're not going to keep yourself. You're not going to bring yourself home to glory. He is. His power undergirds your faith so that you don't fall away. It's all God. I'm going to boast in Christ. <laughs> Man. Okay, we got a couple minutes. Second learnt lesson. The Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Four times, people, in this chapter, God makes this point to the most powerful king in the ancient Near East. And I'm telling you, when God repeats something, repeats truth in this manner, it is vitally important for us to understand why. It's not just there. It's not just repeated so, oh... It's why God is not just declaring, get this, he's not just declaring divine sovereignty with this statement. He is so sovereign over all things. In the book of Daniel, rep repeatedly declares this truth. The book of Daniel repeatedly declares this truth. because Here's why. Because it's the foundational truth that stands behind God's eternal plan, moving through history and into eternity, to establish the Son of Man, the Davidic Messianic King, over the eternal, coming, future, consummated kingdom of God in fulfillment of his Davidic covenant promise. You, you, we have to get that. The whole book's about that. And you know why it's going to happen? Because God rules over the realm of mankind. And he gives it to whomever he pleases. Remember Last time, even to the lowliest of men, which is Jesus Christ. That's the point. God will establish his beloved son over the coming eternal kingdom, crushing and replacing all the earthly human anti-God kingdoms, including the final kingdom of the Antichrist we will see in Daniel. To the praise of his glory, it's Philippians. He didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but humbled himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He went to the cross, the death of a criminal for us. What did God do? Highly exalted him, so that at his name, every knee is going to bow. Heaven, earth, under the earth, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ one day is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the book of Daniel. Thank you that it's a book that's all about you. Thank you that we see a God who is so infinitely powerful and majestic and glorious that to even begin to go down a path of pride is so, so 
foolish. Cause us to be humbled today before you. Help us to humble ourselves before you. Exaltation comes from you. And even if we are exalted, when we hear, well done, good and faithful servant, we're going to know that it's all your grace that brought it about. So thank you for this book. Thank you for Daniel's sweet care for this pagan king. God blessed his ministry to this man. So we pray that you would drive these truths home to our heart to learn the lessons he learned for the glory of your great name. We pray, Father, amen.